All right, this broadcast is live. Uh, welcome everyone to Kiang Ellis Project. And our exhibition for tonight is with the pop culture pirate, Lisa <laughs> Kreisinger, who's here. And we have um, just an hour, because we have a hard stop. We have 59 minutes. We have a hard stop at 9 o'clock, because we're all excited to watch the third and final United States presidential debate. And we have some friends who are hanging out with us, and I'll have them introduce themselves. But first, um, Elisa, why don't you uh, take it away? Sure, great. Well, thank you for organizing this, Kianga. Um, I'm really excited to just have a discussion with other people, um, you know, off online, but also somewhat in person. Um, I know a lot of us have been sharing memes and talking via either Twitter or via Facebook comments. So um, it'll be fun to have a small, somewhat you know, intimate discussion about the viralness of this election and sort of the memification of the electoral process. Um, I would love to show some remixes and some videos as we go along um, and just kind of keep this a, a ping pong sort of back and forth discussion um, with, with you guys and just um, talk about the effects of um, the viral memes, but also um, maybe talk a little bit about their um, effect on art. Are they art? Do they qualify as art? Um, you know, how, how do we judge their success um, if it is something that is viral? You know, are we just preaching to the choir? So I have lots of questions. Um, I have maybe some answers, um, but I'd love to just talk about um, what you guys think in particular because I feel like a lot of this stuff, you know, these memes as, as public and as viral as they are, um, it's sometimes difficult to actually have a discussion about them. So um, yeah, I, I can't wait to get it started and um, do we all want to introduce ourselves one by one? Sounds good. Okay, great. Um, so what, well, I, I was going to say, why don't we go in order, but I realize that everybody's <laughs> order on the screen is probably different than mine. Um, <laughs> I'll so, go. Okay, great. Since I've already spoken, my name's Lelia Mitchell, and I'm based in Boston, and I'm very happy to be here sharing this hour with everyone, eager to, to hear and share dialogue and hopefully spur some new thoughts. And Layla, what do you, um, I know you're based in Boston, but what, what do you do? Do you want to just talk about a little, a little bit what you do? Um, as an artist, I'm largely a photographer, have been a photographer for many, many years, but I'm moving along into printmaking as well to sort of um, get back to a hands-on, um, tactile experience, but also that involves process because printmaking is is very much process oriented, not dissimilar to photography used to be. Um, and the quality of handmade objects is very, very appealing. And I can also integrate photography into that as well. So um, that's my that's my art making work. And for for money, I can I I'm in broadcast media. So that's what I do. Cool, great. Sounds like there's a child or a kitty cat no. out there. Um, no, I have a. I live right by a fire station, so there was an engine going by. Oh. Um, I suppose. Do you want to go next? Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Michelle Farrell. I'm a master's student at NYU in the Media, Culture, and Communications program. I am currently writing my thesis on the way politicians are using. Uh, Twitter, how they're using hashtags and links and at mentions to uh, communicate their platforms and uh, have conversations with constituents. Uh, if that's even what they're doing, I'm actually increasingly finding they're not. <laughs> um, and I'm applying to PhD program to continue my research into the way memes are affecting the political process in America. Cool, awesome. Yeah. Who is next? Um, I'd say, do you, um, Christine, do you want to introduce yourself next? 
Sure. My name is Christine Cassidy. Um, I'm an educator. I live in New York City. I've been an English language arts teacher for uh, approximately 16 years, um, but I'm also interested in the arts and culture and technology and how individuals use arts, culture, and technology to create communities and to connect to one another. Awesome. Great. And then, Mark, thank you for joining us. Do you want to just introduce yourself real quick? Sure. Um, my name is Mark Tabor, and I'm an artist. I live in New York City. and. I'm interested in how technology like this Hangout can be a way of changing how we communicate and distribute information and everything. So I think this is really an exciting project to be watching. Great. Well, thanks, everybody, for hanging out with us, literally. Um, I'm an artist also based in New York City. I My medium is primarily video um, and I've been doing a lot of video remixing so I, I call it sometimes remixing when I'm with people who understand the in, in the internet um, but I also call it appropriation art or um, just video art so um, I'll be playing a few remixes tonight um, but like I said earlier I'd really love to just talk about how or if um, the viral memeification of the electoral process helps or hinders that process, and and um, and hear your thoughts on that. So, Kianga, do you, should I just jump in and get started? Do you want to introduce yourself? Um, is fine. Yeah. Okay. Hi, I'm Kianga Ellis, and I have a gallery in Brooklyn called Kianga Ellis Projects, and my focus is on conceptual exhibitions that present uh, a group of artists who are working in a, a very particular way, a way that is social, a way that involves people and situations. And so uh, I have a, a seven artists who will be presenting projects with this season between now and uh, September and May of next year. And this is uh, an exhibition. <laughs> so thank you all for participating and those who are watching. And if you're watching in a tweeter, our hashtag for tonight is uh, debate remix. So I will be following here and um, can add your comments later on when we get into a discussion. Great. Okay, awesome. So, um, just to start off, I, I came into remixing back in 2007, 2008, um, during the 2008 election season. Um, and I, what really threw me was Obama's um, hope campaign. And while I was a big fan of Obama and Hillary, um, what, what really interested me was this idea that we could vote in change and that's sort of what this Google Hangout was named after um, the remix you can't vote in change and I really wanted to um, make use of an archive that had just become available in 2008 from the um, Museum of Moving Image they had put all of their presidential ad campaigns available on their website for download and so I went through the campaigns and I just began to look at how every presidential candidate promised a version of the same thing. Um, and I've gotten a lot of feedback that this was a really pessimistic approach, but I think it's important to remember that, you know, change can always be voted in. Um, so I'd like to just start off with this remix um, just to get our discussion started. And just bear with me while I figure out how to play said video. Whoops, that's that's not it. Um, okay. Sorry. Oh.
Are, is anyone seeing anything besides no. our lovely faces? No luck yet. Damn. So no one can see the video, huh, except Kianga and I? No, oh, no. I'm trying to pull it up on my phone. Um, um, okay, but nobody's seeing it in the YouTube app. Um, oh. On the top page, on the top, you should have a YouTube button. Okay. Um... Oh, um, um, yeah, you have to allow the YouTube app on top. I hadn't allowed it yet, so. Okay. Okay, so. But I wonder if people can. How can anybody see it? I yes. can. Okay, yeah. great, great. Um, that was brilliant. Mm. Oh, thanks. So uh, that was in 2008, um, based on Obama's change uh, campaign. So w did everybody have an okay time playing and hearing that? Yes. 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 Okay. Great. Great. Um, oh. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to mention if anyone's watching the live stream, that video is also embedded on KiangaEllisProject.com. So 
if, if, if what you're screening isn't showing up, people can, can go to that page and, and, and watch them also. Great, yeah. Um, so that was one of the first things I made out of college, um, and it was really pixelated, and I was really trying to figure out how do I um, use the things that I have access to, and I think that that's what a lot, of, a lot of artists kind of go through. What do I have access to? What's cheap and what's readily available? Um, I had this archive from the Museum of Moving Image, and while things were extremely pixelated, obviously not in HD and, you know, back in the 50s and 60s, there was no HD. I was just happy and lucky to have an archive that I had access to. So that's something sort of as my as I've gone along in my practice, I've really tried hard to find things that were better quality so it looked better. And I find that when you use footage that looks really good and sexy and clear and in HD, it makes it so that the socio-political critique goes down a little bit easier um, because people are more inclined to watch it if it looks really good, if it, if it doesn't look like yeah. you're giving them a lecture. Um, but the one thing that um, that remix reminds me of is that I'm somewhat giving a lecture um, and a really depressing one at that, I feel like, sometimes. Um, but it was what I had access to, and I, again, I think that that's what a lot of artists, you know, deal with and, and have to go through it what they have access to that they can make stuff from. Um, but I think just bringing that back around to what we're trying to talk about tonight um, with the memification of, of the election, I think that that's similar to um, the meme of the binders full of women um, viral <laughs> meme. Um, you know, we didn't see anything that was that um, artistic. You know, it the the viralness of that idea was not in who can make the most beautiful photoshopped collage. It was who could turn out the wittiest copy um, and who could pair that with, it, even if it was stock photography. We saw a ton of stock photos. And here I can paste the, um, the link to the Tumblr if you haven't seen the most up-to-date ones. Um, um, so yeah, again, it wasn't, I, I thought the most interesting thing about that meme, and, and just memes in general, is that most of them look really shitty, and most of them <laughs> look terrible, and look like they've been done in Word. Um, does that hinder, or does that help the viral nature of it? And um, I know, Michelle, I know you, you probably have touched on this a lot in your thesis writing, so do you have any stats? Like, I just have my opinions and what I've seen on Twitter, but do you have... Do you have any stats or research on that? Not, unfortunately, right now I don't. Um, it's actually very difficult to uh, gather stats on it just because, like, where do you even begin to gather that data? I mean, do you start on Tumblr? Do you start on Reddit? Do you start on Know Your Meme? Um, I, what I do have are some really interesting conversations, uh, one especially about the binders full of women, women um, meme that came up. Uh, and, of course, snarky comments from just, like, the commentary in general. But um, I, I, could, I could find this article and post it for you guys. Someone wrote about how the binders full of women meme actually takes away, like, by making that a meme that people are just laughing at and, and trying to continue to propagate, we actually lose some of the more intelligent conversation that could be had about what is the proper way to get women into positions of power in politics. Is there any merit to, uh, to the way Mitt Romney did, uh, attempted to do that? And if not, why not? Um, and, you know, like we, we lose nuance there, uh, which was an argument I found really compelling, actually. Yeah, definitely. And that's something that I had posted in the lead up to this conversation on my, um, on my Twitter page. Or um, I just tweeted, you know, does do memes help or or hinder the conversation? Um, does it move it forward? And I think it's a really interesting question. And yeah, I do. I, I agree in some respects that we lose some of the nuance approaches to this discussion of of women in the workplace. On the other hand, I think that the audience for those articles are very small. That that audience is small and niche, and you only target a few people who would be reading that publication or that article. Um, I just wonder, do we reach more people? And, and actually, actually, I should say, it shouldn't be one or the other. Can we have both in some way, where we're reaching a more um, pop culture inclined audience who is just looking for the bottom line, and that's their, um, you know, the, 
the the audience that is more inclined to get their news from the Daily Show and from Colbert Report, where it's just the punchline that that's their news for the day, that's the headline. Um, or you know, can so can we have both? Can we engage both of those audiences with both of those pieces of media? Um, I think we can and we should. I would love to hear what you guys think and and um, your thoughts on on audience, I guess, in general, and, and are we are we excluding people with the viral nature of like binders full of women? Are we excluding um, certain topics? Are we, I guess, yeah, making it making the discussion a little less nuanced and just boiling it down to its main components, um, for lack of a better for lack of a better word. Well, one of the interesting things I think we find about memes is that. Um, is is sort of the evolution of them. So you like the whole idea about memes is once, especially once you have a good cache of them, is to not say the same, like not have the same punchline as the person before you did. Um, in which case, that maybe you know the the sort of like the novelty inherent in meme culture, which a lot of people say is sort of one of its downfalls, is like oh you're just you know trying to move on to the next funniest thing, but maybe while people keep trying to find humor in a particular meme, like Binders Full of Women, it might actually encourage people to explore parts of that situation that are perhaps not immediately apparent, and, and, and in that way encouraging, like, encouraging uh, the exploration of nuance and, and you know, the consequences of things and the implications of things. Hmm. Yeah, I agree. It kind of... It it puts everybody into the global writer's room and makes everyone a headline writer um, because you're forced to do that research in order to come up with your punchline. And I think that's one of the most important aspects of, of memeing um, is going from a passive audience member to an active creator of something. And that's what really interests me about it. Um, but is, is, there, is there an effort for people to just simply come up with the next clever... Um, clever line or clever concept at the expense of exploring any of these concepts in a deeper way, like the binders full of women. That actually came from a, a, an actual binder that was presented to him uh, when he was governor of Massachusetts. He had nothing to do with it, of course, um, but this coalition of women executives and, and thought leaders brought put their self together, put these, this binder together and presented it to him. So that's one thing, but when it becomes just this constant barrage of clips and that's the next funniest thing, it all goes down to a very narrow and very shallow concept of uh, current politics. And that's, from, from your video, it's been that way since probably now ever since there's been voting you know just these clips these concepts that are very shallow and narrow yeah there is an article on salon.com I'll post it in the group chat that uh, makes that sort of plugging I'll be right back that traces the um, the history of these kinds of punchlines in politics and that actually the, the dynamics that we're seeing now are are not new at all and sort of right. the focus on less substantive issues has always been an aspect of our electoral process. Right. Well, and I, I didn't think that your video was depressing at all. I thought it was quite, um, I really thought it was great and being in sort of the broadcast media business even though the, the technical quality may have not been top-notch and it may not have been shot in beautiful HD, which has a whole other history, the content was so interesting that it eclipsed any technical um, limitations that you feel they, that were presented there. And it really showed me that, wow, things really haven't changed. And you, you can... What ha but what's constant is our desire, mm. you know, hope springs eternal. We're, mm. we're going to make this next round different. It's going to happen this next time. And that's sort of comforting to know, know that we just we keep going on. But 
Yeah, but it's the cultural amnesia that really interests me because why why mm -hmm. haven't why didn't we remember that from last time? Because um, it's too life? painful. Right. You're right. And and what does that say about our ability to hang on just as people functioning in the world? And and that's what I find is interesting because that's a coping mechanism we use throughout our life, you know, yeah. politics or not. Right. Um, it's and uh, but thank you for your compliments on that video. I appreciate it. And I just have a question about the video as well because you're showing basically throughout the video you were showing two party candidates. The only third party candidate that I saw was Buchanan. So I'm wondering you're talking about how memes and are are narrowing the conversation. Um, your accessibility as an artist to what the Museum of Moving Images provided you. Were there other clips of third party uh, politicians, or was it mostly these these major party, the Republican and the Democrat? Yeah, it was actually split down the middle, red and blue, wow. and so it was color coded on both sides. Um, that was at the time. I'm I'm not sure if their archive has remained so okay. um, sta staunchly two sided, uh, but yeah, I agree. It's really a, um, they they. And and but I'm not sure if that's the museum so much as okay. Do do people pay? Do, does a third party invest that much money in an advertising campaign? Have they in the past? Mm -hmm. um, what is on? And and so now we get into a whole another discussion of of the money behind the two party system and 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 sort of the role that capitalism plays in the um, in the electoral process, but um, or at least in the advertising process of of the democratic system, but. Uh, yeah, that it was. It was split down the middle, red and blue. Um, mm -hmm. You chose between Democrats and Republicans, and there was. Um, they didn't even tell you who won actually in the archive. You mm -hmm. had to. I mean, I have some knowledge of American history, but you know, I had to go back and figure out. Okay, so who won? Because you couldn't really judge by the campaign. You know, sure. by just looking at the ads, who could have or would have won. Um, and uh, yeah, it was. Um, they they mostly gave attention to Republicans and Democrats, but I would Oh, oh did we lose her? I think she her screen froze. <clears throat> Frozen. Oops. Oh no. Oh no. I wonder if you can hear us. Can you hear us? Maybe the chat window's working. Yeah. Oh, there you are again. Okay, Back. we got you. Yeah. That was like a little hiccup. Yeah. <laughs> well, so I'm wondering, wondering, like at the Jetsons' age, you know, it's hiccups galore. Yeah. So I'm wondering to go back a, a few steps because it's really easy, especially when talking about this stuff, to all of a sudden find yourself talking like bemoaning campaign finance and the money behind the po the parties and uh, and just wind up winding up in a really depressing conversation that doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> that just winds up like making you want to punch holes through walls. But um, to go back to the to the question of whether memifying things, memifying what an awful it just sounds bad, um, <laughs> is is something that is detrimental. And and this is definitely something I'm I'm exploring right now. But one thing I have learned, and I only recently started uh, looking into the history of of um, elections and electoral opinion and stuff like that. And uh, you're like, you know, in the same way that political advertisements haven't changed much, the electorate hasn't either. Like, I mean, the same percent of people are voting now, fewer even, than before, in spite of the fact that we might consider ourselves a more equal country in many ways, um, and, and a better educated country in many ways, especially with the advent of the internet. And I wonder if maybe, and you know, if 2008 is any indication, uh, since that was the first election that social networks really played a, a really crucial role. Um, and I'm not, you know, I, I don't know my history there, and maybe memes uh, were were still in their infancy. But if maybe the way to attract people who would not normally vote or who would not even normally think about these topics. Is to is through humor and through maybe like a, a sort of initial superficial introduction to these topics that maybe um, 
enough they'll see enough of them that either they'll get interested enough to research so they can do their make their own meme or they'll find one that finally you know strikes a chord and that's how they get politically involved is because you know through the deluge of memes one finally like hits home um and i wonder if that would balance out the like very obvious smoothing over of of wrinkles and and details that we're finding in in these processes i like I, I put that question out to you guys because I, I haven't been able to find an answer one way or another. Well, I think throughout history, at least art history anyway, popular culture or what is ever, what's been considered popular culture at whatever time we're looking at, pop culture has always been a way to make, you know, it's sort of, it's like wrapping the, the um, when you give your dog medication, you wrap it in a piece of bologna. It's like, it's this, the way to make it go down. It's a way to make it palatable. I say it's the spoonful of sugar that makes a socio-political critique go down. It's, it's, just the, it's, it's just the packaging and the wrapper. And um, I think the hope is that you engage people on a level to become active. And I think that's one of the things, obviously, that the meme does is you're active in creating another meme. You're encouraged to, you're encouraged to join in. But I'm not sure that that directly translates in, now I'm going to vote. I think that just translates in, I'm going to upload an image to uh, my Tumblr um, or my Facebook or my Twitter. Um, I'm not, I'm not necessarily, yeah, I, I, and how do we even track that um, to see if there's a direct correlation? Mm -hmm. But I think you bring up a really good point of are we just preaching to the choir then at the same time? Are we really changing hearts and minds or are we, is that our job as, as creators or are we just preaching to the choir by making these things? I'm putting them in my Twitter, my Tumblr, my Facebook feeds, but most of those people I know share the same politics as I do. Right, right, right. Well, maybe something that's, that's happening is um, it makes it popular to watch the debates. Mm. And if that's the case, then, you know, maybe people are, you know, they're hearing from the candidates themselves directly. Um, and, and in times past, I wonder if that was really true. And, and being able to watch the debates with Twitter is so much fun. <laughs> that, um, and it becomes this, like, this enormous sense of, like, community, like, where like, thousands of people are hanging out in one place. And um, if it makes people sort of, you know, watch not just the sound bites that CNBC or MSNBC or Fox News are going to play back to their constituents, then, you know, maybe something is being accomplished. Yeah, I know, because initially um, I, didn't, I didn't watch the last debate live, and I was coming home, I was out, and I saw on Twitter, I saw it burn up with all these binders of women, binders of women, and I'm like, what is this about? What is this about? And then I see the link for Tumblr, and I'm like, holy cow, what's going on there? So it really whetted my appetite and piqued my interest to go back and say, okay, what is this? What were they talking about? And to really dig in deep into the debate. Um, but again, you know, is that because I, I have a natural interest in politics, or you know, I have as a as a woman, I feel invested if, if something you know about feminism is addressed. So I don't know if, if it's just my specific quote unquote demographic. But I know it definitely piqued my interest, and that was through the use of of meme and social media. Yeah, but I think you're right in that people. I I mean, I would love to tell you that you're unique, and I'm sure you are in many, many ways, but perhaps <laughs> not this way, in that um, I, I think you're right in that a lot of people want to go back and, and not be left out of that conversation. There's a meme yeah. happening. They know that at the water cooler blogs the next morning, they mm -hmm. will not be in the know. And so how do they catch up and be in the know? And um, I think that that's about any meme, regardless of its, if it's political or not. Um, but I, I think that... Uh, yeah, I think a lot of people want to go back and fill in the blanks and see what they missed in that respect. And then the question becomes, does that, does that peaked interest translate into a voting block? Right. I, yeah. I don't and know that any of that from, does. Yeah. Um, it just makes it this binders full of women a really popular topic, but is anyone voting? Well, maybe which is, something... Which is the really depressing part of it all. Um, I have a couple a couple of thoughts about that. Um, one, it, like the idea of community is totally like part of the reason we vote 
is not just to express our, to complete our civic duty, but also because our friends are voting, right? And so if we're creating a community of people who are sharing lulls all centered around political topics, the hope is that that is the same community that you will, you feel that you have to vote, otherwise you will not be able to show face November 6th. Um, or you know whatever the day after after the election is it's, is it November fifth this year? Uh, November sixth. Six, yeah. There we go. Um, but you know the point being that like if we if we foster this idea of community like that is politically engaged, then that that will be the sort of you know impetus for people perhaps to go to the, the voting booths is because they want to continue being part of that community. They know that part of that being part of that community is being politically involved. That, it's sort of a weak argument. I know that there are a lot of people who post funny political memes but then don't actually give a fuck about politics. Um, I think and then the other point of it is that uh, actually the hardest part about voting and the people that actually change the most elections are rarely the undecided voters. It's actually usually a struggle for each of the parties to motivate their own base to go out and vote. Um, so it's uh, that's part, it's like, it's, you hear a lot about undecided voters, but a, a lot of work goes into just making sure that decided voters actually care enough to get to the polls. So I guess the difference is, are we trying to win hearts and minds? Are we trying to, like, educate people and change their opinions? Or are we trying to rile up the base and get people who agree with us to agree with us and go to the voting booth, you know? And, and those are two different goals. Something else yeah. I think we've seen is um, the candidates, and this is where I think it can be really powerful, is uh, the social media or the, the remix work. Candidates need to respond to issues in ways that they maybe otherwise wouldn't, wouldn't have to um, clarify their points or make apologies. Um, so in some ways I think that the pop culture maybe is having a positive effect in that when something just becomes so popular because it's silly and funny, then the candidates are forced to, you know, to talk about the issue. But was, did Mitt Romney have any follow-up to his binder full of, full of women comment? I don't know. I don't think so. Well, the bi I'm thinking about the 47%. He oh, did, that was uh, brutal, yeah. He did eventually... A, apologize and kind of back down from that in, in some respect um, but no it's a fair it's a fair point and I, I mean I think some some of it gets a little silly on both on both sides but uh, yeah I think if we had a meme that was linked to some decided action to uh, register to vote or to submit your um, change of address information. Like I know with millennials and 20-somethings, you're moving all the time, every year. So where you lived last year, where you lived last election season isn't the same. So it requires a considerable amount of planning to register to vote. Um, and I think that that's one of the things that the viral nature of social media did well this this season was on Twitter you you saw the hashtag being used you saw people getting out links to here's where you register to vote here's how you do it if you were registered in a different state last year um, and by the way today's the last day for Massachusetts Rhode Island but you know you saw kind of at least I saw my Twitter stream um, when the last days were counting down to those last days to register to vote so you couldn't escape it um, which was great, and and even in New York City, there were people on the subway platforms yelling and and trying to get people's attention to register to vote on the subway platform um, at Atlantic Antic, which is like this big fair in Brooklyn. There were people out on the streets encouraging people to register to vote. So it was cool. I'm I've never seen that before, and it was a great reminder to do it. Even though I've been surrounded by it and I saw it on social media, it was like, oh yeah, I have to do that and here's a great opportunity to do it. So um, again, I'm not sure how, I'm not sure that there's a direct correlation at all. I'm not sure if I could back that up with statistics. I just know that the more people talking about it, I think the better. Um, 
But Mark, we haven't heard from you. Do you want to <laughs> chime in? Anything you want to agree or disagree with? Well, yes, I have one thing that I've been thinking about, at least with the power of the meme, is that if I've, one thing I've noticed um, looking at, say, web browsing habits on my own web page and reading about it with things like analytical software is that the attention span of the average web user is extremely brief, like literally seconds, like just a handful of seconds is all you get to grab somebody's attention. So the, the power of the meme is that it is quick. And in our day and age, that's important in order to capture somebody's attention. If somebody's attention is captured very briefly with a meme, the question is still open if that will go anywhere, if that person who's attention has been captured will be led to investigate the issue in any more depth. I don't know. But I think that it's still as a way to um, turn somebody's head and maybe inject a little thought that could make a difference in the long run. Makes the meme something that ought to be developed further. That's my opinion. Yeah, and just in terms of art, the um artistic implications of that. I think when we were talking earlier about where did this idea of memeing the electoral process start, I mean, I think back to the Obama hope posters and how everybody had that in some form of a bumper sticker or a poster or a t-shirt. Um, it, it was a physical, it was a physical thing that you can touch and hold and identify with and project emotion onto. It was a product in a way. Um, but it started with with an artist, um, with, you know, appropriating mainstream popular culture text, you know, a photo, um, and changing it and modifying it and then exporting that out on social networks. And then everybody had their avatar on Facebook. You could hopeify yourself into um, an Obama-esque avatar. Um, and uh, yeah, it was again. How did that? Did that change? Did that? Did that encourage people to vote? I'm not sure we know or can track it, but I think it's a yeah. In the terms of just getting capturing people's attention with with that one small concept or idea is is how you um it's really how you you kind of get that ball rolling and i think bringing video conference again, my, yeah um sorry folks that's okay um the the role of the artist in that process i think i think the role i think the artist plays an important role in that process is is where i'm going with that one um and uh, with other artists in the in this chat, I don't know how do you guys feel about your own art practice, and and where do you think what role do you think art plays in that? Can I can I add a question to what you're describing, and um, which is is there a difference when an artist, however you define that, makes the work versus someone who doesn't identify as an artist, and is oh, yeah, yeah. is the artist doing it? Does that make it more successful? Or I, how think, we... I think it all depends on how many followers, how much cultural weight that person has, whether or not they identify as an artist or not. They could ident they could not identify as an artist, but have, you know, 10,000 Twitter followers and something could take off. And I think it just, it, it, it matters what the social platform is and, and how much um, weight that they're, that they have in, in their social networks. I don't know. That's my opinion. How, Christine, what do you think? I, 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 I have to think about it. I mean, I, I mean, I'm not technically I'm not an artist, but if I see something or if I think that something is going to be powerful or that should be shared, I'm going to retweet it or I'm going to post it on my Facebook. Um, I don't have legions of followers, but I think by by sharing that information, I think it, it's starting to put across an idea and it's trying to persuade people. But are we are we persuading our community who's already persuaded? Are we actually making any inroads to those people who um, may not vote at all or who just 
Well, are I think it so might at least, I think it might at least start the conversation. Mm -hmm. I mean, the meme I think is taking the place of comments really when it comes to blogs or to Facebook or anything. Instead of you know commenting, people might put up a meme or a picture or you know a rebuttal, a, a visual rebuttal. Yeah. So I think at least it starts the conversation. Right. How deep that conversation goes, I think it depends on the the two or you know the community involved. Right. Yeah, I you, you know, know anytime I mean, yeah. there's discussion is it's a good thing. Yeah, I mean you talk yeah. I mean Elisa talked about before, you know, people, you know, shouting on the platforms of the subway, yeah. you know, go out and vote, vote vote go out and vote. Um are people necessarily going to go out and vote because of that? You know, maybe maybe not. So, right. you know, right. there is a possibility. You know, maybe I'm just an optimist, I don't know. Well, yeah, the, but that I think is a really interesting perspective, that optimistic perspective. It's one that I fight really hard to uh, copy paste onto myself. Um, but yeah, is it just a way that, is it just a coping mechanism? I mean, if anything, I think the, the, the use of social media and the way that we are remixing politics with um, social commentary and using pop culture as our lens with which to do that with, if anything, it makes us feel better. And I think that that's one important role. I mean, you know, I, I do. I think that that's an extremely important aspect of this because we're talking about it now. It makes us feel like we have community. Whether or not we actually do is something completely different. But it makes us right. feel as if we are in a community that we share, that we're not alone, that our ideas and our concepts and our politics are shared with other people. Yeah, and yeah. I think that's an important aspect, especially to identity politics. Um, that mm -hmm. we are sharing yeah. commonalities across platforms. And, you know, I, if we want to, I mean, we can or, I mean, I'd love to actually talk about identity politics a little bit since um, I think it plays a big role in this election season, but also because um, I've got two remixes. I mean, a big part of my practice is um, focused on identity politics and using that as a lens through which to make stuff from. So um, I'd love to show a quick remix. Well, one that I made in 2008 again, um, but let me show Ann Romney since we are only 12 minutes away. I feel like this is kind of like um, we're counting down to New Year's. Um, but since we've only got It's not going to be quite as much fun. Yeah. <laughs> let me try and queue up a video. In the meantime, um, what, what do you guys think about identity politics and the role that it plays? And in particular, Mark, I, whoops, sorry, sorry. Gonna I'm having a hard time with playback on the video. So I think you have to click the YouTube button at the top again if you want to see what uh, Elise is sharing. Oh. Okay. Okay, so that was my quick attempt at making um, just the gems that Ann Romney gave us in the um, Republican National Convention, um, making her into a lesbian separatist feminist, and just trying to really figure out how do we take something so <laughs> opposite, it's so great um, and and turn her into like this very gay gay friendly. Um, 
uh, political caricature. And I, I think, but um, Michelle, earlier you brought up a really good point of like, are we just laughing at them? Um, is this just, like with memes, are we just laughing at them? It's a one liner that we're laughing at. I often struggle with, well, are we just laughing at the fact that she's gay? Is that, is that what's funny about this? Like, because that's problematic if we're just making gayness funny. Um, so I'd love to hear your thoughts, you know, if you can refer or not refer back to the remix, um, but just, you know, sort of talking about identity politics, um, how does that relate to you? How do you feel about um, how the election has covered identity politics? And I'd love to start with you, Mark, since um, we haven't heard from you, and you're the only guy here. <laughs> Well, I've, I'm very interested in what you guys have to say, so I've been been listening, and um, I think that one thing that has occurred to me is not everybody can come up with a meme, and not everybody can um, write rhetoric. So one of the things that a meme can do for some people is give them a way to um, participate by passing it along or share it with their friends and say I approve of this that's why I'm sending it to you I think you might like it too and that is a powerful thing and I think there are a lot of things on the online now where people are using photographs for example and and other things that they find and displaying them uh, uh, for the benefit of other people, even though they may not have been able to make the photographs to begin with, but they post it because they like it, because they approve of it, and they and they express themselves through that way. So something that's portable, like a hope poster or a meme, can be a way of making it a thing that other people can be a part of. Mm. Definitely. Um, at least I wanted to say something also about um, why, why I really appreciated your Am Romney remix in terms of identity politics is even as a straight woman I found the framing of women particularly well for in, in both in both um, conventions actually the emphasis on you know you should elect him because his wife really, really loves him, right? And, you know, a woman is really a great woman if she's a mother and mm -hmm. has a husband and a family. You know, so there were these narratives about what it is to be a woman involving children and marriage and obviously heterosexuality and all of this that seemed to suggest that um, it's somehow relevant to who we should elect as a president. So I... Um, I thought your remix really spoke to even those questions that I had watching the, the um, convention. Well, as, as much as we fancy ourselves, I mean, certainly on the coasts, we're much more, we think we're much more evolved and more liberal about um, our, our identities and, and how they are presented to the world. Boy, the reality is it's very narrow. It's still very much a white heterosexual world in politics, even though we have a biracial um, president and um, an African-American family to look at. Mm -hmm. It's still remarkably heterosexual and white here. And in the landscape, um, and to embrace outside of that, presents dangers for the candidates. They, they may not get their money from their, from their supporters if they sort of veer off to the left or veer too far to the right. I was listening to um, some radio up in New Hampshire the other day. I was in a store and um, Paul Ryan was making his bid saying, my daughter and I are going out to kill our first deer today and no. isn't this great? And I was thinking, <laughs> Wow, uh, I mean that's to me a horrible thing. But I had to step out and say, there's a whole swath of people who are embracing that identity, and mm -hmm. you know, it's just mind-boggling to me that 
yet I see a very narrow presentation of what's acceptable behavior and what's acceptable um, politics. So let's go kill some deer. <laughs> it reminds oh. me of that uh, that part in the the last um, debate where. Uh, He asked a question, and Mitt Romney spent like the next five minutes just making sure that he pronounced her name correctly. Yeah, her name was Lorraine. Not not a like, terrifically difficult name to pronounce. Not maybe identifiably ethnic, and he was just baffled that this woman, who was obviously not white, uh, would not have a name like Raquel or something like that, <laughs> Lorena. It was Lorraine, and just that that moment, uh, which did get memed a little bit, especially on Twitter, it got riffed on pretty hard, uh, was was a moment that I, I really realized, especially for Mitt Romney. I think one of the things, if you look at the general trends for the memes that uh, get made for him, are memes that riff on his white male privilege, mm. uh, which is actually kind of encouraging, I think, is that that's the one thing that people are finding to really stick Stick him on is this white male privilege. That and his dog, strapping yeah. his dog on top of his car. I was just thinking car. of that too. Well, we have two minutes before the next debate starts, so we could go on. This has been great fun. Uh, maybe, Elisa, you could give us, you know, a 60-second... Sure. ...something. Yeah, sure. I think I, I love ending at this point because I think it really hits back and, and brings us back home to why we love memes, why we share them, and why they're such a part of this election. And I think it's because, you know, with the options that we have, we feel like we're part of a community that isn't represented, uh, either in the mainstream or what we see in um, an option to vote for, maybe. Um, and I think that be, when we share things and, and when we post things on our Facebook wall as like, I endorse this, I think you would like it too. Um, we we validate that portion of, of ourselves and of our politics of and our, and our identities. And we hope that other people share that as well. And I think it's just a validation that, you know, we're not alone, even though maybe we feel it behind our computer and behind our screen. And so um, I know that's one of the reasons why I started remixing, you know, to find that community. <laughs> Um, and I think this Hangout was a great example of building that community. So thank you guys all for joining us and for participating in this discussion. And I hope we'll continue the discussion online, either on Facebook or on Twitter, um, perhaps during the debates, during a commercial session. Um, but, uh, yeah, we've got a couple. We've got four minutes. So um, thank you guys so much for joining. And um, I hope we will all keep in touch. And, um, yeah. and yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thanks for watching. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. This record, this uh, hangout is going to be saved. Uh, it'll be on my YouTube channel. I'll post it. So maybe we can, if you have other thoughts, we can um, have comments on YouTube as well. Great. Great. Well, my cat has great. also been here. <laughs> oh, <laughs> kitty. So, thank you guys so much for joining, and uh, hopefully we'll keep in touch. All right. All right. Enjoy the debates, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>